who is here, uh, but she has asked me to earn my flight to Prague uh, by doing this talk, which I'm happy to do. Apparently I have to earn my flight back by doing a good job at this talk. Uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Um, so, if you aren't aware about the CAF Protein Structure Classification Database, uh, this was started about 22 years ago by uh, Christian Arengo and Janet Thornton, uh, and it is a, a primarily structure resource, and we aim to classify uh, all of the protein structures in the PDB. Uh, and this can be boiled down into two main steps, uh, really. We take structures from the PDB, we chop them into structural domains. Uh, and then domains that have a common evolutionary ancestor get grouped into superfamilies. Uh, and these superfamilies have been arranged into a broad hierarchy according to their structural similarity. And this is where CAS gets its name, uh, class, architecture, topology, homologous superfamily. Uh, so the, the kind of hierarchy is useful for just browsing around the, uh, the sort of structural universe, but really the, the, class, the, the cluster that we're really interested in is the homologous superfamily, which is talking about evolutionary relationships. Uh, and just to note that this is class, classification is based on 20-odd you know, years of expert curation, although it is guided by automated algorithms. So just to summarise, structures from the PDB chop into structural domains, uh, those, uh, each of those domains will be assigned into a superfamily where we have r good evidence uh, of uh, a common ancestor. So the, the point about structural domains, um, I'll make it if, if you're not uh, familiar with, uh, with, with this idea, is that the, uh, a protein will have its own evolutionary history, its own evolutionary story, uh, but equally so does each of these structural domains. They're kind of like building blocks, uh, like Lego blocks. Uh, so you'll see these domains in different contexts in different proteins. So whilst it's useful to consider the entire you know, evolutionary story of a particular protein, it's also very useful to consider the, the story of each of these domains because you'll see them in different contexts elsewhere. So we work very much at the domain level. Uh, and this helps us to, to have very accurate uh, boundaries on our domains and therefore on our models uh, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the structure information gives us an awful lot of information. However, there's a huge amount more, as we've just heard from Uniprot, there's a huge amount more information uh, in, the, uh, in the protein sequence world and the protein function world. So part of what we do in our sister resource, Gene3D, is we start off with our, the, the, the information that we know about our structural domains, and then we add in information from uh, sequences and then function. So the first, the first step of that, I mean, this is really whisking, whisking you through an overview, is you build a, a library from our CAF structures, a hidden Markov model library, and we use sensitive sequence similarity tools to zip our query sequences from the various sequence databases pa past our uh, structural library, and we can predict uh, with, with good significance, uh, with, uh, sorry, we can predict uh, where these structural domains lie on these query sequences, uh, and we can be pretty confident about um, how, how good these predictions are. So the important thing there is we're adding in lots and lots of extra information that we get from the, from the native sequences, but we also, where these sequences have been annotated from structure, we also get to pull in that information as well. So, so some of the, lots of these sequences uh, have very detailed annotations from gene ontology. Some of them are enzymes, we know some uh, drug binding, we know uh, mutation. So a lot of this information can therefore get pulled into our structural annotations. So we're bringing in, starting off with structure, we're bringing in sequence, and that helps us to bring in function. So a word on our update release cycle. Generally speaking, we, so we, are, we, we download structures from the PDB every week, and we have, an, uh, we have a, a flow, uh, what's the word? We have a pipeline which is just con constantly working on these structures, constantly chopping uh, these PDB structures into domains, constantly assigning domains into superfamilies. Some of that is guided by uh, curation. Uh, the easy stuff uh, we, we do by automated uh, algorithms. So that's happening all the time. Um, we then, uh, hopefully every year, we then freeze this database and we provide lots of extra uh, data. The data that we use in our own research, this is data such as structural models, alignments, functional annotations, and so on. Um, that's, we, we've made a commitment to keep that, all of this data for our own research, but also to provide that data to uh, the community. Uh, but this takes a while to, to generate this data, which gives us a, a delay between the cutting edge PDB structures uh, and the extra data that we have on a frozen release. So, just the point is that if you are interested, only interested in where, CAS domain, where these structural domains lie on PDB uh, structures uh, and which CAS superfamilies they belong to, 
then you can get that information from Cath B, uh, and that is updated daily. So if you're interested in the very latest data and you don't need all the extra stuff, um, we, we do a daily uh, download of our very latest annotations. So a sneak preview of the release that will be uh, at the very latest, September, in a couple of months' time. So we're adding um, lots and lots of new uh, domains, structural domains in. Uh, we're adding also lots of new superfamilies based on some new automated uh, SVM methods to assign, uh, yeah, assign these domains into existing superfamilies and some new ones. And a bunch of new and interesting folds that are also being added in. So this is really bring, get, getting us uh, very up to date with, um, uh, with the, the, the structure in the PDB. So just to summarize some of the stuff that hopefully you, you guys might be interested in, um, I've already mentioned Cath B. Um, generally speaking, on a practical level, there are very few changes. So for the majority of the data, um, there are very few changes between what gets assigned in Cath B and what gets assigned in a, uh, a frozen release. So they're pretty safe to use. Uh, we also provide uh, data sets for non-redundant non data sets if you, use, if you want to benchmark your own algorithms, or benchmark your own studies. Um, so uh, similar to Astral, if, if people are familiar with that. Uh, available as classification lists, PDB sets. Uh, and we, a lot of our tools, visual, visualization tools uh, and algorithms, we're porting over to, to GitHub. So we're kind of uh, trying to open up our software and our tools as well. Uh, things like aligning superposing protein structures, resolving sequence scans into domain architectures, um, and so on. So, just a word on. I don't have time. Okay, just a word on the uh, the, the data within CATH. So, it's we, we have a, a very good idea now of what the protein structural universe looks like, the distribution of the other protein structures, and it's not uniform at all. So, we have. Some of our superfamilies, so we have, I mentioned we have about 6,000 different superfamilies. Um, some of those superfamilies are enormous uh, and they contain a huge amount of sequence structural or functional diversity. Some of them are much smaller. This, this graph here is showing just the 100 most populated superfamilies of the 6,000 um, and they account for more than half of the known domain sequences. So a lot of, a lot of uh, the, the known domain sequences are uh, squashed into this small, smaller number of superfamilies. So when we want to make predictions about uh, function, we kind of have to take into account that some of these superfamilies can encompass a huge amount of sequence structure and functional diversity. If we look at these superfamilies, uh, th th these are all structures that, uh, that there's good evidence that they have a common evolutionary ancestor, even though they can be extremely divergent uh, across the, 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 the space of time in, uh, in the evolutionary context. But the structural core, uh, remains very, very consistent uh, right the way through. This, so we, this, this is something that we, our group has worked on uh, for a number of years, uh, using this structural core as uh, this kind of ancient fingerprint of, uh, of, of evolution relationships. So whilst this structural core can remain consistent, and here you can see that structural core again uh, highlighted in, in green, the, the lots of different sequence and structural embellishments can change the function uh, uh, as evolution uh, progresses. So if we want to study function, then we have to bring all of these, these potentially large clusters in the superfamily down into smaller uh, clusters uh, that are based more on function. Uh, and this is work that I'll, I've got a few minutes to talk about here, which is uh, these functional families or funfams uh, in CAF, where we have all these domains that are on a, on a superfamily level, and then we cluster them into smaller groups, trying to, if you're fam familiar with EC terms, trying to uh, target a single EC number for, for each of these clusters. And again, this, this is work for a number of years try, trying to allow people to go from their sequences to their structures to their, to potentially to their function. And what this is really trying to do is if we start off on the right-hand side with all of the domains um, colored by what they do, uh, and we kind of fold them, uh, we kind of merge them all the way back to all of the domains merged into a, a big soup family with, with a whole mess of function, then the job is to find a way of cutting this tree to get as large clusters as possible, to give us as much information as possible without mixing up these, these uh, functions. So that, that's, uh, that, that's part of what uh, we're doing in, in, in FOMFAMS. Um, I, I'm zipping through a bunch of research. Uh, the, at the pre, uh, two years ago, there was an independent assessment of protein function prediction going from sequence to function. 
Uh, and uh, the, here we have sort of lots and lots and lots of different predictor uh, algorithms, uh, and low scores are good. Uh, we, we did very well. So this, this, this method is very good for predicting, uh, as good as it gets for predicting function from sequence. So that's a bit of the background into to why this might be useful uh, in terms of how you might go about using it. Uh, so we, uh, I mean, first, the easiest way is to go through the CATH website where you paste a, a protein sequence and you search uh, against, we have two different searches that will be done automatically. Both of them should be pretty fast, uh, where you'll get a list of very close structural domains back and also a list of uh, the, the close matching functional families. So if you have a protein sequence and you're interested in maybe what it does, uh, then hopefully uh, the results that you get from this functional family will give you a good idea. So if you click on, if you click on that, you'll get a list of your matches, the regions uh, where they match, the significance uh, around uh, for, for that match, and also some information about uh, what we know about that uh, functional family. For example, is it, does it have an EC classification? Uh, does it have associated three-dimensional structures? Um, clicking on one of those links will take you through to, to see an alignment of your sequence here aligned against all of the other sequences uh, in the functional family. Uh, and on that alignment, we have conservation scores, so you can kind of get a very good idea of the positions in that alignment that uh, are, are likely to be uh, important in terms of uh, the evolution uh, of, of this particular domain family. And then we map this information from the sequence alignment onto, the, onto a representative structure, so you get an idea of where these positions lie uh, in, in a structural context. Uh, and also you get to see uh, where those positions lie on your query protein sequence as well. So we also provide uh, information about how we, how we got this functional information, the evidence by which we're, we're assigning this information. So we summarize that um, uh, on, on these associated uh, tabs for the particular fun fam. So you can kind of then link back through to Uniprot, which, which is where essentially we're importing all this function information from. Uh, so you can get, get a good idea of not just uh, the, the, the function tags itself, but also how, how they were tagged. Uh, we thoroughly encourage people to try and uh, to include this in their pipeline. So we, we offer um, a RESTful API. It's, it's on an asynchronous um, uh, model. So you, you uh, submit your job, you uh, query your job, and then eventually you'll get your results back. It should take less than a minute. Uh, we're very happy to work with large. We have worked with large data sets. Um, so feel free to, uh, to, to, to give that a go. Um, we also... Uh, again, we've kind of um, uploaded our own tools to, to do this on, on GitHub and maintain them. So if you, if you have requests, uh, then please get in touch uh, because we're, we're, we're happy to work with people uh, on, on getting access to our data. So I've got a, a couple of minutes to go through one of the use cases that we have uh, had in our, in our group working with experimental, um, experimental groups at UCL. Um, that hopefully give you a flavour of the kind of work that we're doing uh, in terms of looking at variation and genetic mutation. So this is sort of using the combined information in CATH, sequence structure and function, uh, to hopefully predict driver mutations, uh, in this case for bladder cancer. Uh, and I'm not doing this research any justice whatsoever. So I'm literally, this is overview, apologies for all the people. That, each slide is probably like two years of work. Um, so I'm skipping, skipping very, very quickly through it. The first step in this was to try and figure out for a given protein with a given set of mutations, try and figure out which of these fun fams are more likely to be involved uh, in, in these, in, uh, have, a, have a role in this uh, cancer path, pathway. So for example, if you know, for a particular protein, if you know that it has 10 mutations, and all of those 10 mutations lie very specifically on this functional family, then it's more likely that that functional family has a role of some description in this cancer pathway. Um, so if, you, if it's a completely random distribution, then you'd expect uh, that functional family not to have a great deal to do with it. If it's uh, uh, very unrandom, then uh, that, that's something that we would look into further. So the first thing was to get a list of these functional families that give us an idea of where the mutations lie. And then once we have that list of uh, functional families, we kind of identified the, the fun fams that we're interested in. We can actually look at the structures of these fun fams to kind of say where are these mutations happening uh, on the three-dimensional structure. So 
Here you have a representative structure uh, and parts of this structure have been highlighted by these uh, spheres. And the spheres give an idea of how many, uh, it gives an idea of the local density of uh, cancer mutations observed within a six angstrom radius. So rather than just kind of saying, does a mutation happen at this residue, it's saying, does, uh, do residues happen within this uh, area of influence? And of course, there could be lots of factors that might uh, uh, affect this. So we compare, we compare what we actually, what is observed from the, from the cancer data, uh, and then we compare that against a randomized set to say which of these uh, local densities are unusual, which would we not expect by chance. So again, that this highlights, in this case, this highlighted uh, these five different sites that had far more cancer, uh, cancer mutation, well, mutations from the cancer data uh, than we would expect by chance. So this, provide, this provided us with our kind of structural regions that went into the, the, the next stage, which was actually correlating those regions with what we already know about functional sites in our fun, fun sites. So we're correlating the high-density high cancer mutations with additional sites uh, on, on what we already know. And this goes back to what, what I showed before about the, having the, the sequence patterns for all of the sequences within our fun fams and then looking for these really highly conserved positions and trying to map these highly conserved positions onto a structure and then mapping those back onto uh, what we know about where these mutations are happening. So I've mentioned fun sites. Uh, th th this, is, this is where we're looking for these highly conserved sequence patterns. And finally, uh, we, we then took these, I mean, obviously we're, we're benchmarking all of these steps uh, algorithmically, but uh, a final step was to, to look at these theoretical models and work with um, experimental groups uh, to, to actually uh, to, to, to try and make some predictions and try and help guide their experiments uh, in, in terms of uh, where they're looking. So, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm zipping through this, uh, but, but this, this, was, this particular case was FGFR3, uh, and the, the study in question was looking at the, um, the activation rates. Uh, and it turns out that one, one of these residues, one of these mutations, which uh, very, very much increased the activation rate, uh, which played a, a role, in, uh, which played a significant part of the, the role in its um, pathway of cancer, this residue was, was not available, uh, sorry, was not obvious from the, the general hotspots that you see from these cancer mutations. So usually you'd be looking at these, these kind of hotspots of cancer mutations of where you see lots and lots of different uh, uh, mutations at particular positions of this, uh, of this protein. But the one that really made a difference uh, was there, but it didn't really show up uh, on, the, on this kind of typical hotspot analysis. Um, but it was within this sort of structural region. So this, this is something that we uh, are already working on and continue to work on, not just in this context, but uh, other experimental uh, areas as well, like the uh, beta lactamases and so on. So ultimately, what we what this work will try and do, and this this is stuff. So this this stuff is already there, already available, uh, and we're very interested in working with people at, on their particular examples uh, and integrating these tools and these data into pipelines. Uh, this is what we will be uh, adding in. Uh, predicting our, these cancer driver mutations and adding this into the sequence to the function and to the structure. Uh, obviously, this is not my work. Um, I'm involved in a, a large team, so many thanks to uh, John, who did the sequences, um, Tony, uh, Natalie Shani, who are here, who, who did lots of work on cath functional families, uh, Paul and Camilla, who, who did lots of work on the, the mutations, uh, and our experimental collaborators uh, at UCL and beyond. Uh, there were lots of funding. Thank you very much to all of these guys for giving us our money, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> okay, I'll invite questions. Are there any questions? Anybody would like to? Yeah, if you'd like to go up to the mic. Thanks. Okay, pretty nervous. <laughs> Any, okay. so, can, I say, can I say something? Like I'm in, so inspired from you because you said two days ago it's better to share something. So let me ask one question. When you superpose all of the super protein structure from the super family, how can you build out the phylogenetic analysis for all the for this 
for all the proteins because their sequence identity is so low. Yes, so, so this is one of the reasons why we, we have, so when we assign structural domains into superfamilies, uh, we, we are looking for, generally speaking, we're looking for two of three pieces of evidence. So we have structure, sequence, and function as potential pieces of evidence. So if we have two of those, if we have a, a decent sig sequence signature or a decent, uh, sorry, decent sig sequence signature and some structural similarity, then that's generally a good, uh, a good indication that it can be pulled into the family or structure and function or sequence and function. They're, they're the kind of evidence that we, that we use when we uh, curate these. So often lots of structures come in that have very similar, um, th uh, very similar annotations to, to the annotations that we have already done, and they're easy to kind of pull in. When we have new uh, things that are new, i.e. I, we don't have very many uh, sequence relationships, that's when we need our manual curators to go back to the literature um, and, and, and you know, work our way back through there. It's a kind of detective, detective game. Yeah. Thank you so much. And sorry, okay. I have too many questions. May I? Last question, yeah. Because <laughs> I have something to share. All right, so, oh, first, I'm from Australia, all right. <laughs> Whatever, straight on my. And uh, the fact is, we don't have an evolutionary model for protein structure. That is correct. So, uh, you know, Jenny Stone's bad paper, the top three is the JTT evolutionary model. So far today, it has it reached probably 4,000 citations, according to the Google Scholar. Then, my research is, all right, JTT model is an extension from Dayhoff's Day evolutionary model. It's still, Dayhoff's method, it still works pretty well. So my, my research, because I understand there is no real evolutionary model to describe the protein structure directly, but in Dayhoff's and JDT's method, they compare protein sequences. They compare proteins that have more than 85 sequence identity and extract the amino acid replacement and create an evolutionary model. All right, so my research is, what if all her protein data, all, what if all of her proteins have been crystallized? So I have developed a method to create an evolutionary model for the secondary structure. And right now, when I superpose all of them, I can describe the secondary structure transition probability for each aligned residues. So right now, I'm going to share one thing, because I have two supervisors. Another one is a crystallographer. So we are interested in a in signaling t uh, domain, and that is a super family domain. So there are so many structures similar to that, and, but the sequence identity is lower than 25. And there's one thing really interesting, because there is a, that domain relates to in, in a immune response, and uh, we are wondering there's a domain probably has the same function because it relates to the neuron degeneration. But really interesting thing, there's an independent group. They accidentally just observe that is not a signaling domain. That is an enzyme. Can I, so what's your question, very quickly? <laughs> <laughs> the question I, I, is, I don't, can you have a better phylogenetic analysis for superfamily domains? <laughs> Can you repeat the question? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even hear yeah. it. Chris, Christine's there. Christine's yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you should look at the quantum resource, which is something that Janet and I worked on. So we use structural information to guide the multiple sequence alignment of all the relatives in the superfamily, and then we use the tree fan method of Richard Gerbin to derive a phylogenetic tree for the superfamily. So the quantum tree resource, if you Google it, there is, that's how we use structural information for a phylogenetic tree. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Thank you very much for your question. And because we don't have another speaker, I'm just going to allow one more question from the back. So, yeah. 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 Um, just a quick one, I guess. Um, so there is uh, ligand in information in PDB. The question is how these mutations change the 
um, active site and the fit of the ligand? Do you tend to look at that? It, it's a really, really good question. And it, uh, adding the ligands back into uh, the, kind of what, what we display here has been uh, yeah, a, really, a really important part of what we're doing for, for not just this, but a bunch of other things. Um, so uh, we're kind of excited to hear a lot of the work of, uh, that's been going on in terms of curating ligands, which ligands are you know, really important in terms of uh, different pathways. And that information is you know, being made available. So uh, yeah, we, we, we do some modeling, uh, but not, not a huge amount of modeling in terms of around active sites. Well, uh, I, haven't talked, I haven't spoken about it here. We are certainly looking at protein binding around active sites, domain partners around active sites. Um, and it's some, certainly an area that we are, we have some uh, research in and we're very much looking to do more research in. Uh, I, I think it's a, a really important part, yeah. Okay, thank you for that question. So I would just want to say thank you to all our speakers um, in this session today. Thank you for all.